Good evening, everybody, Uneducated Economist. Got an article I want to share with you guys. Link is down in the description. A lot of people ask, where do you get these articles from? Where is your sources? Who are your sources? How do you come up with all this information? And um, for one, like, I, I do this a lot. I end up filling all my free time in with constantly scrolling for articles or reading a Federal Reserve speech or looking for something to maybe do a video about or just something that's come up new in the news and just reading different opinions on it. I have no one particular source that I go to. A lot of times if I see something common in the feeds that are coming in, like I see the mainstream feeds, like I use Google feed a lot. And if I see a, like a common theme coming in, I can tell what it is that the, like the mainstream is wanting the narrative to be. And then I look for articles that are contrary to those. So I, that's, if you notice that I have a tendency to be a bit of a contrarian in my, in my view, but that's kind of what I end up doing a lot is that I've always kind of run against the grain. So if I see something that's come up and it's very common out there and everybody is talking about it and they're just talking as if they're an expert on it, I begin to look for things that are different from what everybody else is saying. And a lot of times, like when I put out these videos, it's not so much, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can tell this too. It's not so much that this is the way that I'm exactly believing a lot of times I'm trying to bring up the argument that is maybe related to the article so that the discussion can be had. Um, a lot of times that comes off as like, this is what you believe, you know, well, whatever, you know, I put out a lot of videos. I've, you know, talked in a lot of different directions on a lot of different items. Now, if you've watched my videos from the beginning, you probably have a pretty firm grasp on what it is that I have a belief in and what it is that I think the future is going to be like. Now, nobody, and I've said this many times, nobody can predict the future, nobody knows what's gonna happen next, but a lot of us know by watching the Federal Reserve, we know that if there's ever a major downturn into the economy, the Federal Reserve is going to do something. Now, what that something is, is anybody's guess, and a lot of people have called it out that they know exactly what that is. I have a tendency to believe a little differently than what everybody seems to think. So I have come up with my belief on what I think the Federal Reserve will do when it comes to trying to stimulate the economy when it comes into the future. But in order for that to happen, there's going to have to be some serious changes made to the way the Federal Reserve can legally inject money into the system. Now, the article that I'm going to leave for you guys this was really good because I was going through articles. I found this headline. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it got caught my attention. And I started reading the article and I thought, man, this is really good. This is very different from what a lot of people are saying out there. And when I went and saw who had written the article, it was Michael Pento. And I thought, of course it is. You know, this guy was one of the most influential economists when I first started getting into, into like research in the Federal Reserve and, you know, just the economy in general. Michael Pinto was like, he was probably in the top five favorite guys that I like to listen to and, and read the, uh, read the writings of. So I'm going to leave a link down in the description for, for his article. And man, does it not paint out the possible deflationary death spiral that could come into the future? Now, the way I see it, there's two real possibilities that could come into the future. I mean, there's two, like, obviously, like I said, there's nobody can tell the future and there's a million scenarios that could come to it. But really, it's either the Federal Reserve has to do something or nothing. Those are the, those are the two options. And if they do nothing, then everybody dies, right? The, the whole world collapses. Everybody, like, you know, loses their jobs, their houses, their possessions, their retirements, and everybody dies, right? So that's option A for the Federal Reserve. Nobody likes option A. Option B means that they have to do something. And doing something is now very difficult for the Federal Reserve because they put themselves down at the lower bound, which means dropping up interest rates is no longer an effective tool like everybody is used to the Federal Reserve doing. Print up money, drop the interest rates. That old game is the same thing they've done time and time again. Here's the problem with the lower bound is dropping the interest rates is not an effective tool and the quantitative easing is actually causing money velocity to slow down. 
go and look. I'll leave. That's another thing. I'll leave a link down in the description for Money Velocity. Go and check it out. It is just absolutely like in the toilet. I don't even know how far back the chart goes, but it's like the worst that it's ever been. So Money Velocity is at its worst. The amount of money in the system is immense. Now, the idea that there is going to be like a tapering or contraction, that is the deflation, the contraction of money and debt. And now you can look at the inflation that has taken place. And I said it had been taking place the like, you know, that's the way I've always seen inflation. It's not the way I've always seen it. I shouldn't say that. The way I see inflation, the expansion of money and credit, the prices are the results of that. Same thing with the deflation. But the deflation is not going to be like an instantaneous price drops. Right? Deflation is the destruction of money and credit. It's going to make it harder on people. When people start losing their jobs and start losing you know, everything they have, this deflationary scenario is absolutely the worst for anybody who is invested into the system. The only people it's really good for are people who realize that cash is still king and held onto their cash, waiting for the moment that everything went on sale. And to think that that's not a scenario that, like to say that can't come, it's delusional that it is a scenario and it does come and it will come at some point. Now, the only way, not the only way, I shouldn't say that. The way I believe the Federal Reserve is going to deal with that is to deal with it with the money printing, the helicopter money. And go and read that article that Michael Penta wrote where he talks about this is the reason why things are so different this time around is with that stimulus. But the main thing about the stimulus and all the money that went to the people from whether it was the extended unemployments or the forbearance or anything, all that stuff is unproductive debt. And that's another thing to think about is that unproductive debt means that you have to be productive in the future and pay for that. Meaning that you will have to postpone consumption at some point to pay for this unproductive debt that is now lagging. It's going to drag on the economy. And that is a serious situation. It's not, it's not a matter of like kicking the can down the road anymore. It's like, you can kick the, the can down the road. It'll work. It'll, it'll kick it up, but it's just like getting high. You know, eventually you can only inject so much drugs and it just doesn't work anymore. Like you can, you know, it sucks because somebody said like, I cannot relate to you when you talk about like getting high and related to the economy. But to when it comes to debt, debt and drugs, they could they could be like I, I kid you not, you could practically deal with the mindset of somebody who is addicted to debt and somebody who's addicted to drugs. You could practically put them in the same room and and you know go through therapy and treatment on the same you know with the exact same rules. I mean it's that relatable. And the part about it is is that the more you use it, the less effective it is. The more you need it, the, the more you have to have it and the bigger it has to be. And when you decide that it's over and you're not going to do it anymore, you get sick and you can't handle it anymore. And the pain is just so much. And some people actually die from it. Like I've known people who were such alcoholics that when they got fed up with their alcoholism and they couldn't handle it anymore and they just didn't know what to do about their life, they quit drinking and it killed them. It got to the point where they needed it to survive. Like if they didn't have it, they weren't going to live and that's exactly what happened. So I think about that situation coming up. You know, I mean, how much can we actually take before it kills you? Before it kills the, the person who is meant to benefit. And is it a benefit anymore? Does it make you really feel that good? Yeah. Productive debt. There's a difference. You know, we talked about this. We talked about it and we related, we, <laughs> we related it down to saws and beers. Like you can stimulate, like if everything was either a saw or beer, no matter what you spent your money on. 
right? If you spent it on beer and everybody spent their money on beer, yeah, it would stimulate their economy, you know? There's a lot that goes into beer. There's a lot of manufacturing and agriculture and stuff that goes into making beer. And as long as you're buying beer and consuming beer, the economy is going to be awesome. But as soon as the beer runs out and you've purchased it all with debt, now you have to go to work and pay for all this beer you drank. Now, had you instead purchased a saw, well, you got to work the saw for a while. And although you don't really get the money right away, if you work the saw for a while and cut up a bunch of boards and fasten them together and sell those products, eventually... What you earn from selling those products will pay for the saw, pay back the principal and interest from the borrowed money, and then start giving you a profit. It's productive debt. And all the money went into buying beer. Uneducated economist, you guys let me know.